Welcome to Gloucester Point, Virginia, home of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Come down to the boat basin and take a tour of the oyster hatchery, part of the Aquaculture Genetics and Breeding Technology Center, or ABC for short. Our goal at ABC is to breed fast-growing, disease-resistant oysters to support the East Coast aquaculture industry. Our mission is to distribute our elite broodstock to industry hatcheries for commercial seed production. The best of the best are kept for our breeding program. By broodstock, we mean adult oysters that have been held in captivity for the express purpose of breeding or propagation. The reproduction season starts by conditioning our oysters. This means we raise the water temperature and feed them plenty of food to stimulate them to maturity. The same process happens in the wild, but in the hatchery, we can control the timing of reproduction. In the wild, oysters spawn by releasing their eggs or sperm, called gametes, into the water in a random mix. This is too uncontrolled for breeding. We dissect eggs and sperm out of females and males to control exactly who mates to whom. To begin the spawning process, we first have to shuck open the oysters. We insert a shucking knife into the hinge of the oyster and pop it open. Once the oysters are open, it is apparent whether they are ripe or not. These oysters are plump and creamy, and the veins on the oyster to the left show their eggs or sperm are crammed into canals, ready to be released. But how can you tell a male oyster from a female oyster? To do this, we take a small biopsy from the gonad of the oyster using a small glass tube usually used for collecting blood samples. Just gently nicking the surface of the gonad will release gametes. We dab the sample onto a microscope slide and take a closer look to see if we have a male or a female. Females have easily recognizable round eggs, as on the left. Sperm are harder to see individually, but are clearly recognizable by their frantic swimming about. To remove the gametes from the oyster, we use a scalpel to gently scrape the gonad area. The oyster is not alive when we do this. Then we rinse the gametes into a beaker. The gonad area covers both sides of the oyster. A single female oyster can have millions of tiny eggs seen as white particles at the bottom of this beaker. For females, we count the number of eggs because each should result in one larva. For the males, well, there are too many to count. They will do their work by competing to fertilize an egg. To fertilize the eggs, we simply pipette some sperm from the chosen male and add it to the eggs from a chosen female. Within seconds, the active sperm will have encountered a lucky egg each cup contains the eggs from a different female. We repeat this process many times to create lots of different genetic combinations that eventually will be tested against each other in the field. Here are some unfertilized eggs. Notice the lighter circle within each egg. After eggs are fertilized, the nucleus breaks down. In just minutes, the newly fertilized embryos will begin to divide and divide some more. Hours after the embryos begin to divide, we start to see free-swimming trochophore larvae. The larvae are placed into tanks full of clean, filtered seawater, with aeration to make sure the water stays oxygenated. We have about 150 tanks and the hatchery can house many millions of larvae at once. To keep our oyster larvae healthy, we feed them a well-balanced diet of microalgae, tiny plants that larvae and other critters in the bay eat. But we want our larvae to eat the best, so we grow it for them. Algae cultures are started in flasks of sterilized seawater. Like all plants, algae need minerals, carbon dioxide, and light. We feed our larvae four different types of algae, sort of the meat, potato, and vegetables of the larval nutrition. Once the algae multiply and become dense in the flask, 
they are ready to be transported into a larger container called a carboy. The carboy gets nutrients too and we're very careful to clean during this process so the algae don't become contaminated. The algae doubles and redoubles in the flask and when the color gets dark with algae cells they are transferred to larger containers called carboys for about a week before they're ready for their next move. The carboy is then transferred into an even larger container called the cow wall tube where algae will increase in density for another week just like the flasks and carboys. The color of the water starts out light and grows darker and darker as algae multiply. Finally the density is sufficient to feed to the oyster larvae. Back in the hatchery the larvae are growing in their tanks, eating and excreting. Every couple of days, we drain the tanks and change the water. This gives us a chance to clean the tanks and check on larval growth. But we don't want to lose the larvae, so we catch them on mesh screens. The screens get larger as the larvae grow. Next, we take the mesh screens and carefully rinse the larvae into a beaker. The label with the name of the culture goes with the larvae everywhere the larvae go, so we always know who's who. The larvae in this beaker are about four days old and can be seen as little granular specks swimming in the water. While the larvae are in the beaker, we have the opportunity to check in on them to see if they are happy and growing, like any young kids. When they are active and swimming throughout the water column, it is a good sign they are healthy and hungry. But because larvae are microscopic, they have to be counted under a microscope. To evenly distribute the larvae in the water, we stir the beaker. Then we take a sample using a pipetter and look at it under the microscope. Oftentimes, there are so many in the sample that we need a counter to keep track of the number as we scan back and forth. Here are two day old larvae. We call these D hinge larvae. Notice how they're in the shape of a capital D. Here are seven day old larvae. Notice how much larger and darker they have become. And here are 14 day old larvae. While they look big here, they are only about a quarter of a millimeter or 250 microns. Larvae make their way through the water in a structure called a velum and has a tiny hair-like structure called cilia. These beat constantly to swim. The velum is also how the larvae feed. Note the tiny microalgae alongside the larvae on this slide. After about two weeks, the larvae are ready to go into metamorphose, into a sedentary oyster by attaching to something. We know they're ready to do this when we see dark eye spots, or better yet, when the larvae have developed a foot that they protrude in a searching action. The appendage below the larvae on the right is the foot. When the larvae are ready to metamorphose, they also start to secrete a cement-like substance, which makes some of them stick together. In this picture, the larvae and the beaker have formed a column in the water because of its stickiness. To separate the larvae that are ready from those that aren't, we use a larger size screen. These eyed larvae, or hot larvae, are collected and poured into a coffee filter to store for up to four days. Filters are then wrapped in a damp cloth and stored in the refrigerator. When all the larvae that are ready to set have been harvested, it's time to move them to a setting screen called a downweller. The downweller has a mesh bottom and ground oyster shell has been added to the bottom. The tiny pieces of shell are called culch, which provides substrate for the larvae to attach to. In the downweller, seawater trickles in from the top and flows down through the mesh on the bottom. This gentle downward pressure helps the larvae to settle on the culch. And because each piece of culch is only slightly larger than the larva, each metamorphosed larva will become an individual oyster. After metamorphosis, the oyster will never swim again. 
The oyster is now called a spat, and new shell begins to grow quickly. Here you can see the inner ring of the original larvae and the new shell below. You can also see the newly formed gills under the new shell. The seed will double in size in just a day or two. In about a week, individual spat are now easily visible to the naked eye. These spat are about half a millimeter. Even though they're still small, they're hardy and start to eat large quantities of algae. In fact, we can now no longer grow enough food to feed them. So we move the seed outside to our nursery. Outside, water is pumped straight from the York River into these troughs. Water flows up through the mesh bottom cylinders and out through the top. Instead of a downweller used during setting, these devices are called upwellers. Mother Nature can provide more than enough food for these hungry seed. After six to eight weeks in the nursery, seed are ready to be deployed to our field sites for grow out. We have two types of farms. Here you see our rack and bag system. On this farm, the oysters grow in mesh bags, slightly off bottom. Our other type of farm is called a long line system. On this farm, oysters grow in hanging baskets. Both types of farms grow beautiful oysters. As our oysters grow, we monitor their survival and growth for 12 to 18 months. The groups with the best performance are distributed to the industry or selected to breed the next generation. Once selected, they make their way back to the hatchery to start the process all over again. Thank you for taking a tour with us. For more information, visit our website.